And as I said, in practice, it's common to use to use to manage uh, millions of features or billions of features. This is the case when you're dealing with images, actually. When you're dealing with images, like this is a cat, this is not a cat, as you can see, <laughs> hundreds of millions of dollars have been <laughs> have been invested in that problem, <laughs> which is kind of a little uh, weird, but. Uh, when you start with this image, this image is made of a lot of pixels. Each pixel has a color. Each, pix each pixel is a feature. Okay, one pixel is like the surface, another pixel is like the distance of the school, and so on. So you have millions of pixels here, so you have millions of features. Okay, and we know how to deal with that. Uh, we, are, we have systems now that can deal with that. And on images, the thing that is working pretty well is the deep learning. Okay, so what is deep learning? So you'll see it's extremely simple. Deep learning is really, or, or uh, neural networks, let's say, is really nothing but a particular class of function. Okay, with an optimization algorithm to find one good function among this class. Okay, it's not the best because that's impossible to find, the class is too large, but one function that seems to be good. Okay. What is the class of function we're talking about? It's very simple. It's a complex function, but it's not that hard to explain. So you have the features that are coming in here, and each r circle here is a neuron. Okay, and what a neuron does is what? Is the linear application, so multiply by a number to be determined, to be optimized, add a number to be optimized, and then threshold. If you are above a certain uh, threshold, then I, I say this is one, otherwise this is zero. Okay? And this one or zero is outputted by the neuron here. Okay? And each neuron does the same thing, but with different parameters, different multiplication, different additions. Okay? And then all these neurons, this is the first layer, all these neurons outputs one or zeros, and then it gives all these one zero to the second layer. So each now neuron on the second layer gets all the one zeros from the first layer and does the same thing. Multiplication and addition, thresholding, and there is a one zero, and so on. And you go to the next layer, and you go to the next layer. When we are talking about deep learning, it means we are using neural networks with a lot of layers. That's why it's deep. Huh? That's where it comes from. Okay, and at the end, you could imagine having a single neuron saying, I should go, I should say one when it's a cat and zero when it's not a cat. Okay? That's it. Neural network, it's really that. It's just this class of function. Now, the magical thing about neural network is that we have an optimization algorithm that seems to work because it's a nightmare. This function is a nightmare. <laughs> okay? It's extremely complex, a lot, a lot of parameters. Okay? But we have a way to find a good solution to the optimization problem. Why it works, we don't know. Why this optimization uh, algorithm works, why it finds a good solution, we don't know. Okay? From a mathematical point of view, we really don't know. Okay? The, 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 the specialists of uh, neural networks are computer scientists and they they know how to deal with that, they know how to structure the neurons and so on, and they know how to deal with the parameters, but we fundamentally we don't understand why it works. The optimization problem. Okay, so that's, that's uh, there is a lot of research about that, of course. And it poses dramatically another problem, which is the black box problem. What does it mean? It means that, of course, once we have optimized the, the, the neural network, we know exactly the computation that the neural network is doing to take the decision, okay? Because we have the successive operations. We are able to do it by hand if we want to, okay? The problem is that we don't know how to interpret it, okay? It's like if you were in a hospital because you had a problem and then someday somebody says, okay, you can go out because you are cured. And you say, but how do you know that? Oh, it's the algorithm that said so. Okay, but how do you, what, what's the computation? Oh, the computation, I can give you the formula. 
we take your height, your pressure, the ta -da, we multiply, ta -da, and we find 0 0.6, and above 0 0.5, you can go out. Okay, uh, is there a risk of error? Oh, it's uh, pretty good, you know, 1% error uh, in the last 10 years, so I think it's pretty good. Okay, that's the state of the art today, more or less. Okay, there is no way the algorithm can say you go out because the temperature, your temperature went down. Okay, that's, that's the problem. That's the black box problem. We want the algorithm to be able to interpret the decision. And this is hard. We know to do it a little bit for some particular uh, uh, cases, even for neural network, but this is a true, a very, very important subject, as you, you understand, I'm sure. And there is a lot of work being done, but it's a very, very hard. And of course, it's important for the person who designs the algorithm, but even for the regulator, if you want to forbid something, if you want to forbid profiling something, <laughs> you have to prove that the algorithm is profiling this thing. Okay, which is not that easy. So this is a neural network. So just to show you that there are so many networks possible, it's a huge field and it's a science, but it's like an empirical science. Okay, uh, which structure to be used, how to the optimization pro algorithm has so many parameters. How do you start? How do you, what is the initial condition? Uh, it's like it's, uh, it's, it's uh, very, very hard. And there are many types. So here's an example of uh, these are the different neurons. It's called, okay, I'm not going to go through that. That's going to take a long time, but it's called uh, uh, embedding. It's a way of solving uh, this uh, uh, curse of dimensionality. But this is uh, this is a structure that is used for Word2Vec. I don't know if you have uh, heard about Word2Vec. Word2Vec basically associate to every word a vector, so a list of numbers, uh, and, and makes it meaningful to add them or subtract them together. Okay? We force the, uh, the, the, the neural network to find a representation of each word so that we can, in terms of numbers, so that we can add them and it is meaningful. So you, you can play with it. You can say king minus man plus woman and it will tell you queen. Okay, this is the kind of thing you can do with Word2Vec. You can play, you type Word2Vec on the internet, you can play with the combination and, and try some words. Some people are doing Word2Vec with images. <laughs> so it's image2Vec. Okay, so you take man with glasses, you subtract man without glasses, you add woman without glasses, and you get women with glasses. Okay, for image generation. This is a way of, uh, when we have this curse of dimensionality, because we, have we are in high dimension, because there are so many words or so many images possible, we are doing... Uh, decreasing of dimensionality, reduce the dimensionality by forcing the algorithm to say a word should be represented by just a list of 100 numbers. And you have to do that. You have to find a way to code that in order to be able to, when we ask him to do a task like a prediction of the next word, finding the some missing word and so on. So he learns, the, the algorithm learns the representation by solving a task you don't really care about but what you are carrying is the representation. This is the principle of embeddings. <laughs> then the today everybody is talking about GANs, where you have like two networks fighting one against uh, each other. Okay, uh, one is trying to fool the other one. Okay, and and then you're going to use the fooler <laughs> in order to generate stuff that looks like uh, the truth, basically. Okay, uh, that's how you can generate these images and so on. This is uh, this is very uh, common today. It's very very hard to train. I mean, you see this kind of example today, but I'm almost sure that nothing is in production using this kind of uh, uh, of these kind of networks because it's it's awful to to the optimization problem is really awful to solve. So I talked about supervised, I talked about unsupervised learning. I would like, th th of course, there are many, many other kind of learnings, but there is one which is very important that I should talk a little bit about. It's reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is neither supervised, neither unsupervised. You don't give examples, but you give rewards to the algorithm. So you don't know 
uh, uh, there are several steps that the algorithm should decide on. You don't know how to uh, tag or to qualify each of the steps. You don't know if they are good steps or not. But at the end, you can say, oh, that was a good solution or it's not a good solution. Okay? So basically, you give rewards to the algorithm if it took the right decision. And this is what was used in this, uh, uh, in this uh, algorithm that you all heard about. Actually, it's a combination of reinforcement learning and deep learning because the reward you give and the structure of the reward and so on are generated by a neural network. The functions that are behind are neural networks. Okay, that's why it's called deep reinforcement learning. So you know that the first uh, it's uh, DeepMind who did that the algorithm that beat the the the, the champion of Go. Uh, the first algorithm learned from examples from uh, 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 true parties that uh, that the true games that were played by humans, and it uh, won. And then they did the. Uh, um uh, how was it called? Uh, alpha Zero, which is the new version of the algorithm that doesn't learn at all from any, that never seen, that never has seen a human being, a true game done by human beings. Okay? It, the only thing, it, 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 how it learned is it started knowing the rules and then it played against himself. And that's it. Okay? And it beats like totally the first algorithm. Okay, it's like it's uh, it's amazing. It's like it's much much better than the first algorithm, who already which already won against the champion. Okay, so this is uh, pretty amazing. Okay, I have to talk about data. <laughs> uh, of course, data is at the core of AI. You don't gonna do AI without data. Okay, you have to understand that the limit between algorithm and data is extremely thin. Uh, hardly there is no limit. Some of the algorithms in AI are, are basically the data themselves. Okay, so it's very, it's the relationship between data algorithm is very intricate. So what is important about data? I uh, would like to stress three things. Of course, it's best if you have big data, if you have a lot of examples, okay? So need for a large amount of data. But it's not the most important thing today where uh, a lot of people th always think about having uh, an enormous amount of data, but it's not the most important thing. The most important thing are the two other points. First thing, uh, various sources of data. You increase the richness of your data, of course by increasing its size, but much, much more if you add and if you join to this source other sources that are very different. Okay. So uh, this is very important. And that's why there is a necessity of organizing the data into data platforms. This is very important. I will give you, I will end the, the talk by two examples, uh, two use cases where data platforms are involved. Last but not least at all, maybe the most important point is that you have, do, you have to have data with good quality. This is the most important thing. The, the, the size of the data will not replace the quality of the data. Okay, uh, what does it mean? It means that you would have to have unbiased data. What does it mean unbiased data? It means that uh, you don't have, it's, it's what I was talking about. If you have data where you only have for the houses, only uh, the prices for the houses with small surfaces, this is biased, you will never be able to uh, find any price for a large surface uh, house, okay? This is simple, this is clear to you, but if you have one billion <laughs> columns to understand that uh, uh, your data are not biased, it's not that easy, okay? Uh, there are plenty of examples uh, of stories that happened where people were using biased data, plenty. I could give you a lot of examples, but you might have heard about Google Flu, which was a big uh, program by Google, it invested a lot of money to predict uh, where the, f the virus of the flu was going. And uh, it was a, totally fa a total failure. Okay? Because they were basing, mainly because they were basing their approach on the queries that were made on their browser. 
and the problem and, and where people clicked. The problem is that the ranking algorithm depends on that also. So it's like a circle. And so they were the, the, the data they had were highly biased. It's very hard to detect when to whether you have a biased data or not. It's very, very subtle. But it can it can has it can have dramatic uh, uh, applications and dramatic uh, consequences. With some fairness problem, of course. Okay, uh, we all know this thing about uh, in some states in the U.S. where the judge now has some uh, uh, algorithms that helps him or her uh, taking decisions whether some pop somebody should go to jail or not. And of course, you are just afraid that there is a huge bias about the whether the person is Hispanic or, or black, uh, uh, or uh, American, Af African American, or stuff like that. Okay. There are some very important fairness problems. So there are many data sources, of course, social networks, website tracking information, IoT, and so on and so on. You have to be aware that there is a GDPR in Europe with some uh, uh, restrictions that are not uh, followed that much today, but uh, since th they're still here. Uh, these are the main principles, limitation of finality. You have to collect data saying what you're going to do with them. Uh, you have to take the minimum amount of data to do what you are supposed to do with it. You have to be clear about what data you are taking. Uh, right to understanding, this is inter interpretability. If you are uh, targeted for an ad, the, the company has to tell you why you were targeted. Explain to you, it's because uh, you went to this website, you bought this thing and so on, that's why we targeted you. Okay, so they have problems when they are using deep learning to do that. Right to data portability, you want to change uh, of uh, company uh, doing the same service. They have to take all the data out and give it to the other company. That, that is not at all done today. <laughs> and right to erasure, try to erase your account on Facebook and you'll tell me about that uh, after. This is very hard, but it's in uh, GDPR. Uh, you might not be aware of uh, the importance today of open data, which is a huge source of information, a huge source of data. Huh? It's 92 countries today that are involved in the open government partnership, and France is a le clearly a leader in that. Okay, uh, You can go see this uh, barometer that you find on the web. I don't know if you see it. Yeah. There is a, so France is like ranked in the first. You have a, a grade on the left side. You see that so France is 72. We open a lot, a lot. We opened a lot, and we and the government plans to open even more. It's amazing how much data is open today. People are to aware now. It's kind of it's public data, non-personal data, of course, okay, but extremely useful to enrich. As I told you, you have to to try to gather many sources of data to enrich your data. So we, this is a very, very good uh, way to do it. Uh, here are examples of open data you can have uh, now uh, in France. Uh, there are more than 250 open data platforms available in France, more than 3,000 in the world, uh, more than 1.5 million data sets access accessible in France today. Uh, a lot of aerial imagery in France are accessible, satellite imagery also, so there are, and it keeps op being opened every day. Yes, there are some data sets that are open really every day. Okay, so as I told you, I, wanted to, I want now to just uh, talk uh, about two applications that I'm involved in, uh, two use cases. These are the th main themes that were uh, uh, that were identified by Cédric Villani in his report on, a on AI, okay, uh, with this ranking. So health was the first, and environment the second, and so on. So I'm going to give you a health uh, uh, example and uh, ecology and energy transition example. So I'm involved in both uh, in both applications. The first one is a, is a startup, is private. The second one is public. 
So it's a startup which is called Namer. It's we're about 40 people now in it. So it's not that small. Uh, what do we do? Well, basically we're the, the I think we're the, the, the biggest uh, scrapper of open data in France and we're starting now in the world. So non-personal data that we collect, uh, that we clean, that we join very hard to join. We use geolocalized data, so uh, at very uh, different level of geolocalization. And we put uh, uh, them together using this geocoding. Okay. And then at the end, we arrive to that. So basically, here you have the open data or potentially some data we can buy also, but al always non personal data. Okay. So just some numbers. We have more than 600,000 data sets. Uh, we have unstructured, we have structured data, of course, like in C data or stuff like that, but we have also unstructured data, like uh, text or images, like aerial images and stuff like that. Then we go to the next box. On from unstructured data, we extract some information, geolocalized information, like about some uh, entities, like parcels, buildings, uh, fields, or whatever. On text also, we can get uh, information from text gathered on the web. Uh, then we do some joins, show code joins. We had a lot of AI here. And then we do what we call the digital twin. So basically we have like 80 different entities, like parcels, buildings, fields, companies, stuff like that, where we have more than 400 attributes for them. Okay. And this is very powerful, and we sell this uh, uh, this data on on uh, on platforms. So, for instance, uh, here are some some examples. For instance, uh, we're able to uh, say on each uh, building or each house uh, what is the uh, the potential. Uh, uh uh, solar energy that can put be put on the roof. So because we know if there is a, a chimney or not, we know if there are uh, 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 the, the, the dust rate around the house. We know if there are trees that could block the the, the, the workers to work on your on your on your roof. We know the slope of the roof. We know a lot of things like that. Okay, NG for instance has a list of forty. Uh, 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 attributes to qualify a rooftop to put uh, solar panels. Okay, and with this kind of platform, you can say, uh, "I want all the addresses in France uh, with all the specifications." Okay, and I want to uh, massify the, the 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 work, so I want to have all the the. I, I would like to gather all the, the the locations which are in the same street, for instance, so that it costs less and stuff like that. Okay, so we sell these kind of services where today NG is basically looking at uh, Google uh, map and uh, on the satellite images by hand and calling. So this is, uh, and we do that of course so, so on roads, on so many, many entities. And here is an example also uh, on facades where we're able to extract uh, uh, the the surface that is covered with windows on the facade, so that that is very important for isolation and uh, stuff like that. So this is the kind of information we get. So this is one example I uh, wanted to tell you. So about energy transition and energy uh, and eco ecology transition. Now I will spend a little more time on health. So this is a da this is a Namer is a data platform, okay? It's really that. And on health, basically, so it's a, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, mainly about uh, a public uh, national project, which is called Health Data Hub, uh, and it's also a data platform. I think this is very important to organize data platform, and I think that in this uh, organization of data platform, uh, the collaboration between public and, and private entities is very important. So application of AI for health, here is one. Uh, here uh, it's an algorithm that detects pneumonia from X-rays, okay? So here you have a deep uh, neural network. It has 121 layers, okay? You can imagine the complexity. Uh, it's uh, the figure I showed you, but you have 121 layers of neurons, 
Okay. The designing, the design of the neuron structure is of the neuronal network structure is very hard. Okay, it's uh, it's an art. It was trained with 100,000 uh, images on 14 different pathologies, and uh, the article claims to be more precise than the radiologist. I say it claims because I'm not a specialist, and I really don't want to be the one to say yes, it does or not. And most of the people that says yeah, today. Uh, the algorithms are better than uh, radiologists for that. I mean, they don't know what they're talking about. It's very hard to have an expert eye. And we always have to be very careful that it's not because it works on some images that uh, the generalization error. We are, on for, for health, we are like scared that the generalization error is not that good, <laughs> okay, that it doesn't generalize well. It's full of examples of algorithms that were, that had a problem of bias. I just give you one example. There was this algorithm uh, on working on, I think, on, uh, I don't know which image, if it was MRI or X ray. And it was doing very, very well. And suddenly it went really bad. I mean, the results were really, really bad. And it took time for the people to understand what was happening. And what was happening was totally stupid. I mean, when you know, is that the algorithm was trained on images that were made by machines of given brand and when they started using another brand it didn't work why because the algorithms learned the, all the defects of the first brand of the machine of the first brand and was using them and when it moved to the other machines for the radiologist it looked like the same for the algorithm it was totally different and it was doing a lot of mistakes so we are totally scared by these kind of examples it's very hard to certify an algorithm and say yes, it can go on the market, and we're sure. You need to re-optimize, but then if you re-optimize, you have to do redo a certification process, of course. So that's the problem. Like, how often do you have to re-optimize? How do you often you have to to certify? This is these are, are very hard problems to solve. Uh, it's interesting to know that uh, the regulator in the U.S. Uh, allowed marketing an, uh, an AI-based device to detect certain diabetes-related eye problems. So you can go to a place where just just a nurse would run the algorithm and say, "Okay, uh, you are you have uh, this diagnostic, and you can go to the drugstore and buy some uh, some drugs that are given just to these people without seeing a doctor." This is a major step. Okay, it was a big uh, thing that everybody we're talking about. And of course, there is the problem of interpretability, accountability. I mean, it, it raises a lot of problems here. So what are the applications? Personalized medicine, precision medicine. So basically, the goal here is to say uh, we want a treatment not for uh, a breast cancer of somebody, but of the for the breast cancer of this person, taking, care, taking into account uh, the omics uh, data of this person, taking into account the environment uh, of living of this person. So, and if you go to, I don't remember which hospital today, um, the first thing they ask you to do is to fill up a form, which is like 40 pages long, and they ask you to draw the, the, the map of uh, the place where you live and the neighborhood, where is the bakery, where is stuff like that, and they want to put that now in the in the in the algorithm because they are sure that it's important to collect this kind of information. So this is uh, this is personalized medicine and precision. It's we st I mean there are there are some uh, results already in oncology. It goes really fast, and now, uh, as I told you, like for the breast cancer, they don't give generic drugs for breast cancer, but they adapt the, the to the tumor you you the person has drug design, clinical trials, developments of aiding tools, aids to individuals and aid to, and to professionals, of course. Now uh, we can do a little uh, Cocorico in France because we have beautiful databases. <laughs> this is good news. The bad news is that there are in uh, really, uh, the, their state is really a mess. <laughs> okay. But uh, we have to organize them. It's going to take a long time. But at least we have beautiful <laughs> databases. And there is one of them that you might have heard about, which is called SNDS, Système National de Santé, which is not a clinical 
uh, database. It's a health database, but with no clinical data. It's the, it's the accountant database of the Carte Vital. So all the reimbursements of the health cares are in this database. Okay, it's used for reimbursing. But basically, since in France, we are partially reimbursing almost everything. So you have a footprint of the healthcare pathways of everybody. Okay, so it's huge, like more than 65 million people. You have structured data, it's all just arrays of numbers, more than 200 terabytes, so that's a lot for structured data. And I was talking about unbiased data. If you compare this database to what like the US has, you have to go to see the private companies in the US, mutual, the private mutuals. They have maybe 10 million people in the same mutual, okay? So that's less, but that's not what is important. It's not that we have six times more. What is important is that if you look at the person in the US, that in this database, they are rich, young, and good health. So generalization error is catastrophic. In France, we are lucky because ba basically there is everybody, so it's less biased, at least. It's not unbiased, but it's less biased. Uh, huge potential uh, on this database uh, impact, uh, working with this database on pharmacovigilance. Uh, so the CNAM, like the Caisse Nationale de France Maladie, who is in charge of it, uh, has done a lot of it. Uh, but also, of course, and I'm sure you're aware of that, huge potential impact on the economy of health. Okay, and uh, I don't know if you know this. Uh, um uh, so pharmacovigilance is about finding uh, like the next mediator, basically. Okay, so is there are drugs on the market that have bad adverse effects. So you I don't know if you know this uh, graphic by CNAM, where basically each pathology is, is given with the number of people. They are they are low. They just the just using this database, of course, but it's very complex because you don't have clinical information. So. Uh, just to say that this person has uh, ads, for instance, it's a query that you do in the database with 54, I think, uh, uh, 54 uh, 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 queries gathered together. Okay, and it takes time to, to be able to do these kind of queries. So there are a lot of economists, I'm sure, are using that to understand uh, what should be the, uh, what should be changed in the economy of health in France. I just, before uh, talking about the health that I have, I want to just tell you quickly about the partnership that I have between Polytechnique and CNAM on this SNDS database. And we're basically, so it's a pretty big project. I have uh, 11 people working full time on it. And uh, we're designing a screening algorithm and pharmacovigilance and doing some other stuff. Uh, basically, uh, in order to detect a drug, what normally the, the method, the regular method is to, s to ask a specific question, does this drug uh, increase the risk of this effect? And you gather experts to, it to, to say what it means to be exposed to this drug, how many times you have to take it, and so on and so on. And the whole pipeline is pretty long. It can be a month to months to have uh, uh, an answer with the p-value, uh, the confidence uh, interval. Okay. Here, the, the goal is to say, okay, let's take a lot of uh, medications and, and at, at once, no expert work, and trying to run an algorithm uh, that would say, you should be more careful at this uh, medication and this one and look carefully at them. Okay, so that's what we did. We already have uh, an algorithm running, and we're going to publish uh, some results very soon about this study where we are trying to understand the monk about 80 medications, which one are increasing the risk of fall of people more than 65 years old. So bone fracture, that's what we detect. Okay. At uh, without expert work and just one pass on all the medication at once. Okay. So this is very, uh, these kind of things are very interesting to work on. And it's very, I ideally we would think of an algorithm that would keep running all the time and would detect some potential problems and people would just, uh, experts would just look at these potential problems and see if uh, they are true or not. So I, I'm going to end with uh, this project that I'm involved in. I'm the chief scientific officer of this structure that is called the Health Data Hub. It was pitched in 2018 by uh, Cédric Villani in his report on AI, and uh, it has been voted in the, the law in last July, Ma Santé 2022. 
Okay? So basically, it says three things. It, from my point of view, it's a revolution, but you'll see why. It's a true revolution in health data. It's a totally uh, uh, different way of looking at health data in France. So let me just tell you these three uh, points that you have to remember about the law. The first one doesn't seem to be that uh, revolution, but the two other ones, believe me, they are. So the first one says, okay, there should be a structure that exists today, that exists since the 1st of December, uh, that is called the Health Data Hub, that shall be the platform functioning as a unique gateway to this database, SNDS, for public interest research operated by public or private groups. Okay? So the SNDS was already open by CNAM. Uh, some of you might have used it, but it's not a very modern platform. You cannot do big data, you cannot do AI and stuff like that. So the idea is to modernize all that. Okay, so that's good news, but that's not a revolution. Now, the first revolution is here. Today, when we're talking about SNDS, we're, not, we're no longer talking about just the Card Vital database. Okay, the SNDS has, be has been enlarged and has been enlarged drastically since the new SNDS is all the health data that are coming from CARES reimbursed partially by the national solidarity. So it means that today, when we're talking about SNDS, we're basically talking about all French health data. All the x-rays of any doctors, all the MRIs, all the INSAM cohorts, all the, okay, it's hard to find some uh, health data that are not part of the SNDS, okay? So now the first point is like a uh, little uh, crazy. It's like there should be a structure which is like the unique gateway to all this data, which is not at all structured, <laughs> which are not normalized and so on. So the work is like enormous. Now the other revolution, so the, the idea here is to say, since the national solidarity uh, reimbursed partly uh, uh, the, the cares that, uh, that made this data, it should benefit, of course, to everybody and to public health. So for public interest uh, research, it should be used. It can be used. Now, the other revolution is this point, is that there should be a unified governance for all the SNDS and the hub is going to build this governance. So that's also a revolution because today, uh, if you work in health, if you say, I want to work on this database and this database and join them, then it's a nightmare because you have to go through the pipeline of this database to the pipeline of the, this database and then to the pipeline that allows you to join the two database and it can take three years very easily. Okay, so now the idea is that you'll be able to go to this governance and say, I want this, 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 and this. And, and all the database will be, ultimately, uh, will be put together at the same place, joined, and you'll be able to work on it. So, for that, we have a budget of 80 million euros for the first four years, which is a lot, but not that much if you compare to what GAFA has uh, today on health and in France, invest in France, but it's okay to start with. We have to invent a business model. Uh, we started the working in uh, last January, really hard. Uh, the hub structure opened last dis uh, first, dis first of December. We have a platform that has been certified by the ANSI for security. Uh, it was certified last week. Okay, uh, Monday, I think, yeah. <laughs> So that's, that's this week, sorry. <laughs> so that's very new. Uh, many challenges, but I'm sure you imagine all the challenges, but it's like a huge work. We have to consolidate massive and heterogeneous health data uh, in one uh, uh, place. So we are going to start, we started already by identifying what are the first databases we would like to be able to upload on demand. Okay, and the catalog will be uh, published uh, uh, in January. Of course, all the data in the hub will be pseudonymized. You don't have direct identification of the data and nobody will be able to uh, uh, download, uh, to, uh, to take the data out and will be uploaded on the platform on demand. It's the idea, because you, you read on the, uh, on the press that uh, we are building a platform with all the French health data. This is not the case. 
the data will be put on demand of the uh, project that will be received. There will be no such a thing as a platform with all the financial data. That's totally crazy. Sharing the data facilitate cutting edge research. So that's like modern infrastructure, define unified governance, and so on. And we have also a mission of animation, promotion of innovation. So working with startups, companies, so that they develop softwares, they develop uh, so on for the hub. Uh, bring national and international visibility. Everybody in the world has access to the Health Data Hub. Okay, it's not just for French. And doing matching, uh, being a, a, a platform for matching skills and interests. So I built a, an affiliation for researchers, and we have a lot of companies seeing us and say, we need that, that, and that, and uh, we do the match. So this is the kind of things we've been working on. And I will be finishing by that uh, in order to have some use cases in order to understand where were the ball next and you know what problems we will have we did a call for projects last january we selected 10 out of 189 we had a lot a lot of uh, projects we could we had just the task force for 10 of them and the thing which was important for us is that each project comes with a beautiful database ready to share it we have to discuss, and there is a valorization of the data and so on, uh, there are discussions, but at least in principle, ready to share it, and uh, accepting uh, the princ in principle the unified governance for sharing it. So we have beautiful uh, projects that will start on the platform beginning of January for some of them. So just to give you examples, uh, we have a database of for 20,000 Parkinson patients with omics data and images data. This is an academic project. Uh, Deep Pist is a startup project with 250,000 data mammographies. And all these people are very interested in linking with other database and especially with the Card Vital database. Uh, Hydro is a startup database also uh, that follows, uh, is a startup, um, sorry, is a startup that uh, has a database uh, that follows pacemakers in real time, more than 8,000 pacemakers, and they want to predict uh, if there was a, a heart problem. So they need the, the Card Vital uh, uh, database for that to train the algorithm. We will have all the database from all the emergency services in France. We'll have the Vidal Knowledge Database. We'll have, um, and Malakoff Mederic is. Uh, also, uh, uh, a priori, is ready to open his data uh, for uh, uh, academic research and so on. I would like to finish by one slide because I haven't mentioned that and it's very important. Uh, it's a major topic of AI. I just have one slide, but I could speak about it forever, about ethics and just put some uh, main lines about ethics. Uh, because AI raises a lot of ethical problems that should be addressed by design. So when you are building the database, when you are building the algorithm, and this is very, very, very hard. It's very important, but very hard. We have already seen bias and fairness. We've seen transparency, interpretability, explainability, and of course, of course uh, accountability. These are major themes of research today uh, done by... Uh, uh, machine learners, uh, AI uh, researchers, and so on. And but it's a very difficult. Uh, these are very difficult uh, goals to to reach. Voila! Thank you very much. I hope you learned some stuff. <laughs>